Oh my gosh, I am so excited. I'm so and I hope she does. Something that's um something that's really interesting is, you know, when I was in it, I would get these questions sometimes in Q&As or, you know, sometimes people reach out to me on Instagram and they've got the assignment and they ask me questions. And the question I get really frequently is, you know, when I was in it, they were like, "Do you ever see people do stuff and you think to yourself that's not how it goes?" <laughs> And I was like, no, I've never thought that. Every time someone does something different, I'm like, yeah, that's a better idea. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, it should be like that. Um, and it was this indescribable joy last year getting to watch Karis play the role because when I, it was a privilege to play the role, but I, um, I always felt like this itch wasn't scratched, which was this itch to see it, to actually see the show. And when I got to sit and watch, I mean, it, like anyone can vouch for it. I just cried a lot in those rehearsals, just like happy tears. I was just, it was so, because I suppose the gift that Karis gave me is by singing the song, she let me see this show for the first time. You're listening to the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. My name's Justin, or you can call me Stin. On today's episode, we have our long-awaited Fangirls Deep Dive, co-hosted by Theatre Thoughts editor Charlotte and featuring the show's own writer, the energetic and multi-talented artist Eve Blake. Eve lends her voice and insight into where Fangirls came from and expresses her excitement for the show's revival at the Sydney Opera House this year. We also learned that you definitely don't need to know how to play an instrument to write a musical. You can find all of our behind-the-scenes content and other exclusives by following us on our socials on Instagram at TheatreThoughtsAUS and our new YouTube channel. So get ready to switch on those thoughts and strap yourselves in for a thrilling new episode of the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. Welcome everyone to a very uh, fangirly episode of the Theatre Thoughts podcast. We have, um, I've been anticipating this for very long. Um, uh, we have an amazing artist on the show today. We have a playwright, a screenwriter, a composer, an actor who's worked with multiple different companies including Belvoir Street, Sydney Theatre Company, Griffin Theatre Company in London... They've worked with the Barbican, South Bank Theatre, Soho Theatre, Bush Theatre and the National Theatre. They're the writer of Fangirls the Musical. Ladies and gentlemen, it is Eve Blake. Welcome to the podcast. Oh my gosh, how much do I pay you for that? (laughs) Oh, it's fine. You can just pay us in your amazing energy. Oh, wow. This is like a bargain price. Thank you. That was lovely. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so nice. on the episode, we also have joining us Charlotte Smee, who is our editor at Theatre Thoughts. She is an amazing uh, performer and writer, and she has boosted the Theatre Thoughts website to multiple heights uh, that I cannot thank her enough for. And I'm thanking her very much for joining us on the podcast. So welcome back, Charlotte. Hello. It's good to be back. <laughs> so we have uh, our very fangirls deep dive today. So we're going right into uh, Fangirls with Eve. So the reason we're doing this is because Fangirls is coming back, thank God, to the Sydney Opera House. So you are stepping it up big time, going straight to the Sydney Opera House from from July 28th until September 4, I believe. Yes, I think. (laughs) I I should know the dates, but that sounds about right. Sounds about right. So Eve, well, well, let's focus on you first. So I've done a bit of a spiel at the beginning on you. Um, I think it's fair to say that your your credentials and the, the work you've created with Fangirls is, I, I mean, I'm lost for words because it is just amazing how much it is taken off. Um, so you wrote the score, the book and the lyrics for Fangirls and you performed in it when it first premiered in 2019. And you taught yourself to write music. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I. It, it is wild to reflect on because the origins of this show really were me at the age of, I guess, 22, um, loving musicals, but feeling like there was a musical that I had never seen that I wanted to see that would feel like a pop concert and would be a bit feral and a bit scary and really fun and something that like 15 year old me would have loved undeniably. Like it wouldn't have lost my attention for a second, but something that also my 70 year old dad could go to and cry in. Right. It just felt this impossible thing I'd never seen and I wanted to see. And I really, I never ever felt like I had any business giving it a go. Right. Cause I was 22. 
I didn't know how to play a single musical instrument. I still don't. So wow. was, amazing. Right. Well, I, the thing though is, I like to I like to share that not as a flex, but because I wish that like teenage me could have heard that it's still possible. You know, I think for a lot of my life, I just thought, oh, well, you have to be able to play the piano like Tina Minchin if you if you want to have any business writing, and that is so. Uh, troublesome as a concept because it means a very small amount of people who are privileged to have you know a specific kind of experience or education get to like contribute their voice to musicals but yeah I didn't I didn't have that I just um I taught myself off YouTube uh how to use a program called Ableton which I got for free using dodgy <laughs> means I shouldn't I shouldn't say that but I'm saying it because I was a rat bag you know and I just <laughs> I just gave it a go and the only thing that kind of gave me the vote of confidence to even attempt this was I got this amazing um, grant from the Australian Theatre for Young People that was actually funded by Rebel Wilson mm. to kind of, you know, spend some time at a desk at that company and give it a crack. Um, but the whole time I was making it, I really saw the whole thing subconsciously as kind of an act of fan fiction. It was something I wasn't making because I ever thought anyone would buy it. I was making it because it was this like, gesture of what if what if there was a thing that that looked and smelled and felt and sounded like this and um then like the surreal thing is at the end of that year I, I presented six songs of like my work in progress into a room full of people and I got this massive reaction there were lots of theater producers there that the work was super commercial and I was like what do you mean it's not based on a book or a movie I'm a 22 year old fetus like I'm no one but what I totally failed to calculate is that if you make a show that is about an international fandom of a very real boy band and or specifically like Harry Styles, um, then actually that is an audience who may want to see your work. So then this surreal thing happened where, you know, in the time since heaps of like commercial producers and TV and film producers without like without hearing even two notes of the show go, wait, it's a Harry Styles musical, which by the way, I enjoy a lawsuit free lifestyle. It's not about <laughs> Harry Styles, but it is inspired by Harry Styles fans. Yeah. And because totally. of that misunderstanding, I've weirdly profited off of, I guess, people being extra interested to kind of give it a go. And it is surreal, like, like the, um, the life it's taken on and the fact, like, that so many people now care about it and, like, have someone has a tattoo from it. Like, <laughs> See, that's when I you never, know you've made I, it. If you get a tattoo of it, I know, that's like, tick. I just, I love it. I never dared to imagine, but I I guess, yeah, what I'm really enthusiastic to share with people is I people are like, where did you study? I'm like, I didn't. And people are like, how did you learn? I'm like, YouTube. Like, yeah. you know? Isn't so if you're listening fantastic? to this and you want to make it, amazing. right? If, if you're listening and you want to make a musical, you don't know where to start. Just there are no rules. Just make yeah, it up. Yeah, and I think I think it's also such a thing of like young women often feel like they don't have a right to say these things or they don't have a right to yes, write a musical or whatever. But there's plenty of people who write terrible musicals, not naming any names. But like, <laughs> you can do it. You can write it on YouTube. You make such a good point because, you know, I reflect a lot about how subconsciously, so I fell in love with musicals when I was a teenager, thanks to, shout out to Jonathan Ware, who was my best friend when I was 15, and I told him that musicals sucked, and he said, on what premise? And I just said, they just, like, are so bad at women, and they just, like, don't even, they're not even about anything. And he was like, have you heard In the Heights? Oh, have you heard Spring yes. Awakening? Have you heard Legally Blonde? And he just started just forcing me to listen to these cast albums. And I got hooked. I couldn't help it. But I reflect on, like, I just named three musicals that are created by pretty much all male teams. I mean, uh, Legally Blonde has got a female co-writer, which is, you know, which is a huge triumph in, in musicals. But, like, if, you know, if you walked up to someone in the street and said, tell me your favorite musical, you're probably going to hear a musical with an, not only a male writer, but, like, usually an all-male team behind it um it's interesting because you know as a teenager i would hear these musicals and i wouldn't even think for a second what what if i could do this i would think oh well the girls are the ones yet yeah. <laughs> and the, the men write it and um yeah i think like i think i was i had to overcome a lot of voices in my head saying well you're not really allowed because you don't like you're not um mm. official enough and you don't know what a key is or a triad <laughs> or a stave 
so you can't do it. But it turns out, like, you know, the way I made Fangirls is I, I made it all on my computer using Ableton. And then I had the pleasure of collaborating with, like, incredible musicians who could mm -hmm. figure out the rest and who not only could do that but could take my work and, you know, turn it into dots on a page and make amazing suggestions. Like, hey, you've got a part where this actor jumps from this note to this note and maybe you could, like, bridge them. And they became a really exciting part of the process that I would never – like I would never go without now. I kind of, I like that I'm a bit of a musical idiot because it means I get to work with smarty pants on all my projects and they actually get my work to, they, they, they make it even slicker and better. And they have these amazing ideas I could never have thought of. So and it's that's the out thing well. that I love about theater is that it's so collaborative, you know, nobody does it by themselves and it's such a beautiful totally. thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just inherently like collaborative, isn't it? And and jumping back to what you were saying about the the writing team. So I remember um, when Waitress like made kind of history almost at the Tonys because it was one of the first all female mm. teams that was nominated for the big awards, and and it just popped off like it was massive. What I was going to ask you was uh, how important it was for you to have a um, a female director on Fangirls when you first um, created it. Oh, it was so important. And do you know what was so interesting is when I was making it, um, like I said, I was like this, tw at the beginning, this 22-year-old, totally unproven fetus. And when I wanted a director, you know, artistic directors would be like, huh, it's interesting, right? Because if you look at directors in this country who can prove that they could mount like – a musical with commercial aspirations. You've got like what Simon Phillips, maybe Dean Bryant. Like the list, you can't, you can't even have you. You wouldn't even fill the fingers on a hand. You know, you've got like a couple of people, and they're all dudes. So then I would point to amazing women who might be capable, and there was a lot of like, but she hasn't done a musical before, and I'm like, yeah, because we don't really make them, and a lot of you know, no, who's a woman who's been given an opportunity like this? Um, and I, I would had the privilege of speaking to lots of amazing female directors, but the moment I met Paige, it was just clear that she was as feral as I was and something that has been amazing, right? If you see the show, like it's inherently cheeky and that's from, it's not the writing uh, like alone. It's also the costumes, the set, the choreography and everywhere that you can see that cheekiness, it's this energy that Paige created where it's like when I watch it I, I I can't believe that as a writer I really enjoy seeing my show I think that's quite a rare experience you know people get quite like squeamish and tense but I just delight in all of the funny little ways that that Paige made the work so charming by making it like cheeky and rotten and feral and like transgressive um so yeah I I often think I'm so lucky that I got to have this show directed by someone who had never done a musical and so didn't have any tropes to fall on and who you know like if something felt a bit corny she just went nah we're not doing that then and I I think that's a real strength of the show when I watch it the word is out the theatre thoughts monthly is here and it's your chance to get exclusive giveaways podcast episodes reviews and more direct to your inbox don't wait until next month. Get this month's Theatre Thoughts Monthly now. It takes two seconds to sign up. Simply head to the link in this episode's description and select the Theatre Thoughts Monthly option to fill in your details. It's that simple. You'll receive links direct to this month's edition of Charlotte's Cheap Thrills, early access to an exclusive giveaway only for Theatre Thoughts subscribers, and the early goss on our next massive star on the podcast. Now, let's get back to today's episode. Let's focus on Fangirls. So let's give a bit of context to it. So Fangirls, just in a brief summary, it follows a 14-year-old girl named Edna who is obsessed with the band True Connection and the lead singer, Harry. <laughs> yes. Uh, no copyright intended. Uh, <laughs> uh, Lawsuit-free lifestyle. Yeah, exactly. That's it. <laughs> and, um, and she would quite literally die for her favourite band in the entire world. And uh, she goes to a the, the concert and things kind of go out of hand without giving anything away 
she tries to go to the concert. She almost goes to the concert, but she's unsuccessful. Yeah, she yeah. almost goes. No, 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 it's very confusing. That's right. yeah, she so almost she, gets there. You, yeah, you've nailed it. Exactly. It's What's interesting about um, Edna is she, yeah, she, all of her friends are obsessed with the bad true connection, but she specifically is obsessed with Harry and has a secret theory that he's depressed and trapped in the band and doesn't even want to be a pop star. So that's her point of difference is that she actually gets him in a totally different way. <laughs> and so, yeah, we follow Edna. She, she'll stop at nothing to meet him. And without giving anything away, she goes to very extreme lengths and then, um, yeah, and the stakes, they kind of, they ratchet up in Act 2 and, and things go wild. I never know how to talk about it in a spoiler-free way, but, like, yeah, that's that's the most we can yeah. say. It's, it's difficult because, you know, it's the whole second act, yeah. really. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think we should talk about the musical. I, I once heard you describe it in an interview as Beyonce concert meets rave meets church, and I think that is a really apt description of the type of music that it is. Oh, good! <laughs> Because it's kind of, it's these like amazing pop songs, but then they have these beautiful harmonies of like all these young girls on the stage going, I'm not a great singer, but like, ah, Mm -hmm. and like they've got all the layers and you really do feel like you're at a concert and it's fantastic. And I think that's something that's really unique in a musical because I've never really seen anything like that. Oh, thank you so much. (laughs) I'm so pleased. You know what? That phrase is something I made up before I'd written it. I was like, I want it to sound like that. And I, you know, you always wonder when you make something, is it like what I wanted it to be? Like, did I get away with it? So that means a lot to me. But yeah, um, starting out, I just... I listened to musical cast albums and I really wanted to make something that didn't sound like the others and and was its own thing. And I noticed listening to musical cast albums, often, you know, it'll be led by a piano and then you'll have a band with like some core key instruments. And I listened to like the music I was listening to on Spotify and none of it was played by a band. It was all made by computers Mm. and it was pop music with these like adrenal synths and these like huge kick drums that sound like they were being played at the Olympics opening ceremony. And I just thought... Yeah, it needs to sound huge. This sound needs to sound as adrenal as a first crush at 14. And sometimes it needs to sound cinematic and it needs to have these like these str- these Hans Zimmer strings because like when you're a teenager, everything's life or death. But the, the church um, texture came in when I was early in my research, I was on Twitter and I was at the time, so this is 2015, I was noticing that, you know, there were these accounts that would just tweet at Harry Styles stuff like they said, say an octopus has three hearts I have only one and still it will love you more than any creature ever could and just these like (laughs) devoted tweets and I just wanted I knew that I wanted a sound that sounded like the church of Harry and that was like that really obviously I want the lyrics to be funny but I want the music to have harmonies in it that makes like just makes your eyes water at the the sheer virtuosity of the harmonies and everyone locking together. I I wanted to create that tension between, you know, people being like, um, like, hey, pork chop, hey, darling, hey, daddy, like to Harry, but singing it in like incredible seven part harmony. Yeah, and thinking about it right now, I am a little bit teary, (laughs) to be honest. (laughs) Ah! Get it together. It's a Saturday morning. (laughs) I know, but I just think like it's such a great sort of all the layers. And that's the thing about music, right, is like even when, you know, you don't know anything about it or why it makes you feel that way, like the sort of just the sheer sound and the layers and the and then the synths underneath is like what really gets me I think is because it kind of brings this deep noise underneath the sort of high voices. Oh thanks. Well what's fun is like with the score sometimes we have these subwoofer woofer drops so if anyone listening doesn't know a subwoofer is like it's a speaker that goes really really low and you'll often put it like below the seats or you'll put you'll place it in the theater like low to the ground and it means that we'll have these like boom at the end of songs and it literally rattles your butt yeah, and I does. I just love that and you know frequently people have been like wait so your musical doesn't have a band what but the virtuosity of the live music like comes from the singing and I think you st- you know my argument is as well mm. that often in musicals you'll have an orchestra playing but they're hidden you can't even see them they're tucked away and in our show yeah you know, every time there's music it's mm. coming out of a computer sure but then you get to see the singing happening live and um 
yeah, I, I, I think it's like totally legit. And I think also the spectacle of the musical as well adds to that because it's sort of all these layers of harmonies. And then when I saw it at Wollongong, shout out to Merigong Theatre Company. Shout out to the <laughs> Gong. <laughs> Gong. Um, uh, they had these huge screens and while all the fangirls were singing, you know, Hey Pork Chuck, Hey Whatever, Hey Harry, and they've got all these videos of other fans on the back yeah. screens and it sort of adds to this church thing because it looks like a stained glass window of fangirls, you know. <laughs> was that um, wow, was no that an original, that. like, an original idea or was that inspired by lockdown zoom oh my god i love this question okay so it's uh, and and there's a massive shout out to be made in this so in the script i wrote a stage direction in an early draft that's like in the big budget version of this when the fans sing all over the space you would have projected like hundreds more fans backing them up to give a sense of like this is pre-lockdown this is like 2016 i would have written this of like the idea is you suddenly see and maybe i didn't necessarily imagine that they'd have to be in grids but you would just see at moments where seven people sing on stage as fangirls you would see like 300 more faces around the space singing in their bedrooms so What's amazing is our original music director and our voc- and vocal arranger, Alice Chance. Like in the lead up to the original production, I was in it, so I was very distracted, like getting ready to dance and sing. And during this time, kind of behind my back or like with the production team, she just pulled it together. She wrote up these instructions. She got a whole bunch of choristers, like really good choir singers to sing the parts. And then she got a bunch of random people to lip sync into their video cameras, gave this footage to the video designer, um, Justin Harrison, who then placed them into this big grid. What's so interesting is in 2019, we did it and people were like, whoa. And then we came back in 2021 and everyone, oh, it's a Zoom call. <laughs> like, oh, it just looks like a Zoom call. Right. But, it was, but it's interesting because we wish, we were like, oh, that's a shame. It, it now reminds people of something else. But I think actually in a way, some people said it was really moving that it was like a Zoom call. So look, I, I don't know. I've never heard it described as a stained glass window before, but I love that moment when um, so Paige, our director, had this genius idea to put these big LED Beyonce Mm. screens on stage and yeah there is this moment where like they hit this harmonic chord and they're singing and then you get to see all of these other faces and yeah i I really love that yeah it's it is is, uh, i love the set design um i remember yeah when when charlotte and i saw it and i the set design came on you had all these projections i was just like that is such a genius use of the stage without having like a set that comes in and out you're just using the modern technology that we have. And I think that kind of leads into what makes this like an unconventional use of a musical that has that, um, well, that commercial feel to it, I suppose, that you were mentioning earlier. Let's talk about where it went from 2019. So after you you um, performed as, um, oh, sorry, the name's just gone out of my head. Edna. 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 <laughs> yeah, no, uh, no worries. Edna. Then we had the amazing... Karis, Karis Oka come in. That's that's who we saw in Wollongong. Mm-hmm. She was phenomenal. And you had Aiden as Harry. But now in 2022, God, time's flying, <laughs> isn't it? We have Manali Datar as, as Edna. And uh, Manali's been in Harry Potter and the Cursed Child. She played young Hermione and Rose uh, Granger Weasley. And she was also in White Pearl. So how excited are you to see her take on this role? And do you think she's going to add her own spin to it in any way? Oh my gosh, I am so excited. I'm so good. And I hope she does. Something that's um something that's really interesting is, you know, when I was in it, I would get these questions sometimes in Q and A's or, you know, sometimes people reach out to me on Instagram and they've got the assignment and they ask me questions. And the question I get really frequently is, you know, when I was in it, they were like, Do you ever see people do stuff and you think to yourself, that's not how it goes? <laughs> And I was like, no, I've never thought that. Every time someone does something different, I'm like, yeah, that's a better idea. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, it should be like that. Um, and it was this indescribable joy last year getting to watch Karis play the role because when I, it was a privilege to play the role, but I, um, I always felt like this itch wasn't scratched, which was this itch to see it, to actually see the show. And when I got to sit and watch, I mean, it, like anyone can vouch for it. I just cried a lot in those rehearsals, just like happy tears. I was just, it was so, because I suppose the gift that Karis gave me is by singing the song, she let me see this show for the first time. 
And it was that thing, you know, I started writing it because this is a musical I wanted to see. I love seeing musicals. I wanted to see this one. And she was so creative and and what she brought to Edna just gave me all these fresh ideas. And I'm really excited for Manali to do that too now. And I, like, I don't have an idea in my mind of like, Edna must be like this. <laughs> and I, I can imagine that's confusing to some people because I've played that role. So I think it, I understand why people would assume like, oh, Eve must have her version in her head of how it should go. But it's just, yeah, it couldn't be further from the mm. truth. I like that you were talking about how you don't have like any kind of ideas of um, about who Edna should be. And you have all these things that change. So I guess coming to – my question is coming to the writing aspect. And this leads into – we put a poll out on our um, Instagram and we had a question come oh. through from um, at JR Janessa. She's uh, one of our uh, – she most likes. She likes all of our posts. So big shout out to her. Thank you for being a fan. She's asked, when you first had your obsession as a fangirl – did you know that you wanted to write a musical about being one straight away? Ah, uh, really interesting question. So people often ask me, like, who were you obsessed with as a teenager? And, like, who were you a fangirl Who were you a fangirl of? Um, but interestingly for me, like, I definitely never identified as a fangirl. As a teenager, you know, I had bands or, or artists I was obsessed with, but I was never in a fandom. I was never in a community. So when I was 21 and became interested in fans of One Direction for the first time, it was really remote to me. And I was like, ooh, what's this? And I always admit, like, it began as this morbid curiosity. of like, this is weird and crazy. And then I looked closer and I was like, whoa, wait a second. Why are we using language like um, desperate, hysterical, psycho, over the top and crazy when we describe young women screaming at a pop concert? But if we take the same image and we make it young men screaming at a sports mm. game, we use words like loyal, passionate, devoted. Oh, thank God. God. Love of the game, oh right? Oh my god! I'm, yeah, I'm was... so glad you said that. That is like how I feel inherently <laughs> in my soul towards theatre and sport. Yeah. Well, right. It's like I just became fascinated, and when I realised that dichotomy, I went, "Oh, that's interesting." I became interested in writing about fangirls because I thought, "Oh, this is crazy." <laughs> and then I thought, "Oh my god!" I underestimated these young women and young women and young people, but like largely, be- like because I I gendered fandom as you know for girls and. I went, oh my God, I underestimated teenage girls and I have been an underestimated teenage girl. And I know the exact rage of being like, why are you treating me differently? Because you perceive that I'm just like a little girl. And that's when I knew what I really had to write about. So yeah, I I, I was never in a fandom. I, I wrote about fangirls as like a love letter to fans when I began to understand them in a new way. Yeah, I I remember watching your TED talk about that and literally crying on the bus because what? I, oh. yeah, because I felt so sort of, you know, I, I remember seeing the musical and that was one of the lines that got me every single time. Every time someone sung about being a silly little girl, I was like, <laughs> I'm a silly little girl. <laughs> but yeah, like, I think it's something that's really important is to sort of write about these young women because we deserve to be heard and we deserve to be screaming and crying and whatever about something that's important and whether that's like musicals or theatre or Harry Styles or whatever that doesn't make it any less valid and yeah I was never a fangirl either really and shout out to my best friend Caitlin who brought me two fangirls because they are a fangirl <laughs> and was like you will love this musical and I did so yeah. Oh uh, thanks Caitlin shout out. <laughs> shout out. <laughs> um, yeah so I think it's it's so, so affirming like to see the musical and to see yourself and even if you're not a fangirl because you know if you're not a fangirl I wasn't a fangirl really that's that's actually my thought when I first saw it I was because I remember coming uh not knowing anything about it when when Caitlin invited us along and I and I saw it I was sitting there for probably the first probably 10 20 minutes I have to be honest I was like I don't know if this musical's for me I'm not really a fangirl I don't know if this is for me oh okay and then as the as the show progressed I just fell in love with it because I I fell in love with the whole idea of um and when that line was repeated oh we're just silly little girls I was like no you know what screw you (laughs) of course they can be they can be passionate and care about what they want to care about Harry Styles whatever and I and I just fell in love as the show progressed and then when it finished I was I was a fangirl by the end of it (laughs) yeah Yeah, that that means a lot that's so cool that's because that's totally the dream right I used to always say I want to make a show where people laugh at these girls only to cry with them so that's Mm. cool thank you
This episode is brought to you by Etsy. Oh. Hear that? Okay. Thank you. Etsy knows these aren't the sounds of holiday gifting. Well, not the ones you're hoping for. You want squeals of delight. <coughs> Happy tears. How did you? And spontaneously written songs of joy. I am so happy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, okay. The song needs a bit of work. But anyway, to get those reactions, make sure everyone on your list feels heard with handmade, handpicked, and designed gifts from small shops on Etsy. Gifts like personalized jewelry, custom artwork, cozy style items, vintage pieces, and home decor to celebrate all of your favorite people and their specific kind of special. For original gifts that say, I get you, Etsy has it. Continuing on that topic, as a young writer, what advice would you kind of give to other young writers that are developing works? And is there anyone in particular, this is a good question, is there anyone in particular who we should watch out for? Oh my God, I have so much to say on the topic. Okay. Woo! What advice do I have for young writers and who are some writers to look out for? So I love both of these questions. Um, I'll start with the first one. My advice for young writers is don't shame yourself about what you think you're supposed to already know how to do. Um, I don't know how to focus and write, so I have to use traps. I have to turn off my internet. I have to I have to use an app called Freedom that blocks websites and even whole apps off my computer. And I even use this amazing app called Flow State, but there's a website that does the same thing called the Most Dangerous Writing App. And you set a timer, and then during that time you have to write. And if you stop for more than five seconds, it deletes everything. Oh my god! And that is the only way I get anything done. So you don't have to know how to be a good writer or focused writer you just have to have traps you just have to show up and use your traps um the other piece of advice i'd get is like something that really helps if you're writing for stage is hearing your work out loud and you don't have to hear it by good actors you just have to hear it out loud so it's not your voice in your head because your voice in your head will quickly stop reading the line and go oh no it should be this and you just need to hear it at pace so Something I'd encourage is get your friends around, cook them some pasta and get them to read your script aloud. And you can be really strict with them. Like, I don't want feedback at the end. You know, you know, we're not going to discuss how you'd write it at the end, but just get people to read it aloud for you. It's really helpful and don't um, apologize or get ashamed. It's just a really simple tool. Um, the other thing is... Uh, like I think something I did when I was younger is I would share my work with people and I would be really desperate for their approval so I would get obsessed with their feedback and if they weren't sure about it in the slightest way I'd then like throw stuff out and be like that idea is terrible but something I do now with my friends is I go if you want to show me something early we can do something called gems only mode which means I will respond even if I think it's the worst script in the world I'll just tell you all my favorite bits because I know that it's early I know that you're still finding your way you don't need me to tell you what's right and wrong you can figure that out but right now, you just need some hope, some gems to tell you to keep going. So those are kind of my key my key things. You know what I mean? Like, don't think you're supposed to know how to do it all. You're like, you're allowed to ask for help, and you're allowed to use traps. Those that, that would be my advice. Oh, and also just like, it's great if you're inspired by other things, but by all means, try and write the thing you haven't seen. And if it scares you, that's probably a really good sign. If you're like, I have no idea how to write it, it's way too hard, that's a great sign because you're gonna have to be so inventive to figure it out. And it'll probably take a lot longer, 10 times longer than you think, but that's okay, it'll be worth it. Um, that's my advice. Uh, solid Hope advice. it's not too corny. I think it's great. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's great advice for all writers, okay, to be good. honest. I never thought about the idea of a trap before. I, that's like uh -huh. blown my mind. I was like, a trap? I have. <laughs> have you? <laughs> Fascinating. Yes. I have to trap myself to write reviews when I like come home from a show or whatever. And I'm like, oh my God, I really just want to go to bed. And I'm like, I can have a chocolate if I finish this thing there or, you, you know, go. like have to turn off all my interview as well. Like all the like internet and everything. You have to turn all that yeah, stuff off. Yeah. Or like, or mm. like even a deadline, like one of my beautiful friends, Aisha, who was in the original round of Fair Girls it, during like the 2020 lockdowns, she wanted to write some music and she was like, man, I just can't do it. And I was like, give me your Facebook, Instagram, and uh, it, like everything passwords and you can have them back when you finish X number of songs. And it was great. She really got her work done. Um, but we often will do that for each other. Mm -hmm. We'll just like give each other passwords and, and, and set traps. Um, yeah. You know, I just, 
it doesn't matter. I think a lot about how active Lin Manuel Miranda was on Twitter for like the couple years after Hamilton. And I think like, yeah, if I had a huge success and then I had huge pressure to come up with the next thing, I think I would just spend a lot of my time on social media being like, la 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 la. Like, um, that's no judgment on him, but like, I have to, and now he doesn't, I think he has limits around when he can use it so that he can focus. But I get that too. Like, I just, I would never get anything done um, because I just want to procrastinate. Our brains do. So, yeah, traps. Um, yeah. Okay, writers to look out for. I have a long list, but this is the moment I was born for. I love giving shout outs to other writers who are trying to do this because when I was getting started, I felt so isolated and frequently I'd be trying to write a musical and um, I would want to talk to other people who got it, who are doing the same thing. And people would be like, you should email Tim Minchin. And I'd be like, he's so famous. And why is that the only person people yeah. can tell me? It was Tim Minchin or Eddie Perfect. Oh. And I was like, what the hell? <laughs> no, where are my girlies? No offense to those boys. Yeah. But you know, like, Exactly. Where are my girlies? Where's the girls that gaze in the days? So <laughs> yes, I love that. of writers you absolutely have to become obsessed with. Listen, everyone who is listening, Zara Stanton is the musical director of Fangirls, and she's the musical director of probably all of the best independent musicals you've fallen in love with in Australia recently. But no one is prepared for these girlies' music and lyrics. She is an extraordinary composer, and my jaw falls off my body every time I hear a draft song from her. No one's ready. Like, just I'm keeping this receipt in 10 years' time of like, I told you all. Um, Video Maker, there's a lot of buzz around her. She's currently uh, playing um, Catherine Parr in Six, aka I the blue follow one. Her religiously on Instagram. Oh I'm my with her. gosh. This girly, I became obsessed with her. Look this up on YouTube. There's a song she wrote called Hugh Jackman. So the video is from, I'm like in the front row when she's doing it. And you can probably hear me during it go, oh, like I just, I saw her that night and I went up to her and I probably got really too close to her. It was pre-COVID. It was like, we are to be friends. We are to be as one. <laughs> I just think she, I just think the sun shines out of her ass. She's amazing. Um, Jules Oculo, they are an incredible writer who is writing this amazing musical called Fraser Babies and like the top line that I'll give you is like imagine uh all girls private school debating um themes of like uh young young people finding their voice political activism uh oh god Australia's migration policy uh racism um camp debating young people this is like a very awful summary of it but it's just it's got so many good flavors in it and it's really oh really intelligent writing um cassie hamilton is an amazing writer i've been introduced to she's writing like an incredible musical about um a young woman who goes to get gender affirmation surgery in thailand um that's just like extraordinary and i'm really really excited to follow where wow. that goes jean tong and lu wall two incredible um uh non-based creatives who wrote a musical called Romeo is Romeo is the only fruit. Romeo is not the only fruit. I don't know. Look them up. They're amazing. They're amazing. They're going to change the world. Um, Geordie Shea and Victoria Falconer Pritchard are making a musical called Lala, which is this amazing, oh God, I, I don't know how to give it away without it being um, spoilery, but it's this amazing musical about a young Filipino woman who goes in search of her Lola, her grandmother, who she's estranged from. And um, Oh, it's spicy. The plot is so spicy. Whatever, just keep your <laughs> ear out. It's like camp and fun and irreverent and great. Um, Sam Andrew is famous on TikTok. People will know her from there. But my God, this woman can write a song. This woman can write lyrics. She's doing amazing work with Mel O'Brien, but she also writes with Eddie Patterson and Belle Larcom. And like just that whole gang, they're going to absolutely... <sighs> They're, I want. I want to say. I just want to say they're gonna blow people's dicks off. Like they're just gonna absolutely. I shouldn't even say that, but like no one will survive the wrath of these the lyrics that these four write. Um, and finally, uh, Gillian Cosgriff has just been in Harry Potter for like three years, but she's about to get unleashed on the world again. Incredible lyricist and composer, and like actually can play the piano, like Tim mentioned. So absolutely watch out everyone right now knows that gabby bolt is amazing i can't wait to see the yes, musical she'll write yes. one day jude pearl musical when yes and then finally jude janet pearl. yes <laughs> janet anderson and chikara cogway i would literally just watch anything that they wrote i would watch both of those women fart into a jar like i just think <laughs> they're the best so those are my recommendations 
<laughs> I think they're top notch recommendations. I love them. I'm sorry if it's really rude. <laughs> no, it's totally Don't. fine. Just slap a <laughs> content warning on and you're, and you're sweet. Oh, sorry about that. No, it's fine. It's fine. Well, Eve, I know you've got a bunch of other things in the works, um, which I'm very keen to, to follow up on in future. You're working on uh, adapting a fangirl series. You're working on a screenplay with Thomas uh, Wilson White uh, for Aquarius Films or for a musical adaptation of an Aussie children's book. Um, are you still doing the podcast musical about Mary... Uh... Wollstonecraft! Oh, my God, that's my girl! I love this girl. I, I know I'm obsessed with her. I Unfortunately, I had to depart that for scheduling reasons, which was um, devastating. Uh-huh. But listen, if anyone listening is obsessed with Mary Wollstonecraft, I'm um, same. Literally, let's form a fan club. I'm obsessed with her. But I'm really... My hope and dream is that the company that have got, like, the rights to that story... Um, make a really cool musical with a different creator that I can go and watch and just like be like, oh my God, yes, I remember that moment too. <laughs> so yeah, devastating. But like, I guess a great problem to have, right? It's a, it's a, I, I recognize it is a privilege to have like, um, just to get paid to make up rhymes in the first place. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like if I have a bad day, I'm like, whatever. My job is literally getting paid to come up with rhymes for tampon. Like there could be worse things. It's okay. So yeah, that's, that's the story Excellent. on that. Well, Eve, I think it's safe to say that we love you and <laughs> Australia loves you and we're very, very excited wow. for the return of Fangirls, the musical, uh, coming July 28th to September 4 to the Sydney Opera House. Tickets are available at sydneyoperahouse.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, uh, me too. And I just wanted to say, if anyone listening has seen the show, um, something that's so exciting is we are looking at an almost entirely new cast for Sydney Opera House. And something I'm really excited about is they let me make a lot of changes. So <gasps> oh. uh, particularly to the scenes, I'm like, it is, yeah, it is brand spanking new. And I'm so excited about that. Wow. Oh, that's that's actually really fascinating. I'm really excited. I'm more excited. I'm more excited. <laughs> Yay. Well, thanks, Yay. Tim. I appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to Marilyn Tobacco for helping to organise today's episode. A massive thank you to Charlotte for being our co-host on the episode, as well as the incomparable Eve Blake for being our guest. Fangirls comes to the Sydney Opera House from the 28th of July and features Manali Datar as Edna and Blake Applevist as Harry. Tickets can be booked via sydneyoperahouse.com or by following the link in this episode's information. That's it for another episode of the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. If you have a production you're wanting to promote, have a thought on theatre you wish to highlight, or feel like you can bring diverse and insightful conversation to the podcast, why not come on as a Theatre Thoughts co-host? We're looking for new and exciting people to come and feature in future podcasts and talk with our amazing guests. Contact our team now at theatrethoughtsteam at outlook.com or by hitting us up on our socials. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time here on the Theatre Thoughts Podcast. (laughs) 